This Week in Startups is brought to you by 8Sleep, the first bed engineered to improve your sleep through dynamic cooling and heating, detailed sleep tracking, and more. Get the sleep you deserve and supercharge your health and productivity at 8sleep.com slash twist. And Zendesk, the best customer experiences are built with Zendesk. Qualifying startups can join their startup program and get Zendesk products free for a full year. Visit Zendesk.com slash twist today to get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a special edition of This Week in Startups. We decided that we were going to make a 10-part series because I get the same questions from founders over and over and over again. And I challenged my team to slow down for a minute and say, what's the collective wisdom that we've learned here at Launch, that's our investment company, having invested in over 200 companies through our syndicate, through our accelerator, through our funds, and having seven of them become unicorns. We've really learned a lot about how these businesses scale. And it's changed over the last decade since I started investing. And you know some of the early companies I invested in, like Uber and DataSacks and Thumbtack, as well as some of the later ones that became unicorns, like Com.com or Desktop Metal uh, and Robinhood. We're going to talk about these companies in the context of your next company. And this is a 10-part series. This is the third part of the 10-part series. And this is super important. And this is really one of the most important discussions I have with founders in selecting them for investment. And that is, what is your business model? What exactly is your business model? And when are you going to turn on revenue? We found that the great companies turn on revenue early or at least know about what their business model will be. And there's a lot of innovation to be had in business models. With me today to discuss it is Jason DeMont. Jason DeMont is a serial founder who's worked with me for over five years, and he is the managing director of the Launch Accelerator, which is about to, in the summer of 2019 uh, or so, we'll hit our 100th graduate. Welcome to the program, Jason DeMonte. Thanks, Sue. Uh, and also with me is Emmy award-winning producer, Jackie Deegan. She's usually behind the camera. <laughs> and so you understand our process here at Launch, which is our investment company that does the podcast this week in startups. We do a ton of education. That's the top of our funnel. So up here on the top, uh, uh, Jackie is our managing director of education. That includes Angel University, Founder University, This Week in Startups, and just all the content we do and the conferences. Scale is another conference we do, Content At, and also a Launch Festival. After we meet all those founders and engage them through our free content and free events, then Jason DeMont We'll talk to Jackie, and Jackie will say, hey, these are the most promising companies we met at Founder University or at Launch Festival Sydney. And DeMont will build a relationship with them over 12 weeks after we invest 100000 in them. And then Ashley Whitehurst, who's been on some of these episodes, she will uh, syndicate them at thesyndicate.com, which is our upcoming uh, platform for angel investing. We've done 97 syndicate deals uh, at the taping of uh, this Scaling Your Startup series. So welcome to the program, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, for Emmys, of course. Everybody knows she was <laughs> Emmy Award winning Jackie Deegan. All right. Um, let's get started. We'll go to our first slide here. Start with a business model. Yeah, and um, I'll kick it off. So seeing um, the earliest founders here at launch, a common first-time founder decision I've seen is to really figure out the business model later. And um, we just had Charles Hudson, a precursor on Angel a podcast recently, and he said the um, business model really needs to be your North Star. So, you know, I was really thinking, you know, is that the best approach, DeMont? What do you think? I mean, is it okay to figure it out later? Yeah, so I agree with Charles that having a business model from the beginning is extremely important. And figuring out later is not something that we typically we typically in, recommend founders to do. Um, it should be something that you do from day one. Otherwise, you know, why exactly are you starting a company if you don't have a business model that, that goes along with it? I think something we commonly see founders think about is, you know, look, we're going to solve a problem and then we'll quote unquote figure it out later. And it's most commonly seen in B2C uh, companies that that have tried to do this. Um, and we'll dive into this a little bit later uh, into the show. Um, Jason, question for you that I'm curious about. Can you think of any successful businesses that did not have their business model figured out from the beginning? 
That is a fantastic question. Um, knowing your the answer is no, and, and I'm going to keep thinking if I if I have one in my memory. Um, I have seen people evolve their business model, and mm-hmm. I'll give a couple of examples of that in a, in a minute. But I would say the analogy that is most apt here would be like we're going to start a company, and the three of us are co-founders, and we get a ship, and we put a bunch of provisions on it. So we got a team. The three of us. I mean, we get a couple of deckhands to help us out. We get provisions. That's funding. And then we leave port without a destination. We don't, you know, and the ship is obviously the product. We don't know where we're going. You know what that's going to lead to? Cannibalism. (laughs) Death. (laughs) Suffering. Like, we're going to be in the middle of the ocean. And if we do hit land, it might be random. Nobody would ever leave port without knowing they're a North Star, and I think yep. it's a great analogy mm-hmm. um, that Charles came up with. So if I think back, I'm going to think a little bit about the ones that have evolved their business model. Com.com was charging one time for the app. You could buy the app, I believe, for 10 bucks. Yep. Now, that created a lot of cognitive dissonance. That's the phenomenon when you have a conflict in your brain. Oh, my God. Or actually, it's not even cognitive dissonance because that's when you have two different conflicting ideas. It was more just a hurdle. Um, And it's a decision-making hurdle. Am I going to get value from this? Which is a little bit of dissonance, but it it was a little bit of this tyranny of, oh, what if I I buy it and I don't like it? I can't return an app or people don't know how to do that easily. But then Apple in year six or seven of the App Store turns on subscriptions and says, now we'll charge your card monthly. Here's the rule set. When they moved com.com from $10 one time to ten dollars a month. Paradoxically, consumption and conversion went up. Mm-hmm. Why? You have to ask them why. Well, the reason was, I believe, that, and, and you probably all know this anecdotally, is that when you subscribe to something, you say to yourself, "Well, I can always cancel." That is the contract of subscriptions. I, I subscribe to the New York Times. I cancel the New York Times. I subscribe to Netflix. I cancel it. So it takes out all that friction. And so that's an example of evolving it. But really, you want to know how you're going to make money because a lot of product decisions are going to come from that. Mm. So what is the downstream question that people always ask us, which is, uh, let's say it's the consumer is paying for it, whether it's a company, which is a consumer, or a consumer consumer, so enterprise versus consumer. In either case, they have to know what they're paying for and how they're paying. So those can change what you pay for how you pay, and payment terms. Mm -hmm. These are variables, almost like maybe if we're full sale or which direction the rudder is going, how we're charging people to send, you know, whatever the passengers, how we charge them. So if you think about that metaphor and we continue it, yeah, how you charge first class seats versus coach, et cetera, that can change. That's experimentation. Mm. But you know you're going to charge because you may need to add a sales team and you may need to budget for a sales team. Or if it's self-serve, you don't need a sales team. Well, that could be a difference of one third or 50% of your employee count. That's crazy when you think about it. Like That's like picking a, a 500 foot chip for five people. It, it, it's so wasteful. It makes no sense. Yeah. Right. Well, to continue the metaphor, um, the captain. So first time captains versus <laughs> serial <laughs> captains. Um, what I've noticed, um, the found first time founders make some interesting decisions and I feel like they're they're more like to make this decision to figure it out later. Um, DeMont, what have you seen from going through managing the accelerator? What are our founders doing? Yeah, so the <clears throat> I thought it'd be fun to actually th- talk through a couple of different yeah. examples okay. of kind of things we've seen in the accelerator. We'll, <clears throat> we'll make them a little bit more generic so that- uh, Yeah, we're not going to blame the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guilty. <laughs> yeah. So, but what I was what I was going to do is kind of describe a scenario, or, and we've probably seen a couple of these more than once. And then Jason would say, you know, what would you advise that founder in okay. terms of thinking about let's how their it. business Great. model uh, would approach? So uh, let's say I'm, I'm a founder, I'm new to a city, and I want to find events that are going on around me that match my interests. So I look at Yelp, I look at Eventbrite, I look at Facebook, there's nothing quite right. So I say, okay, I'm going to build an app in which I input some of my interests about myself, uses my contacts to find out uh, a little bit about who my friends are, and then it recommends events for me. So what would be the business model here? Exactly. Okay. So we have an idea of a product. 
let's say it's very personal to us, which is we like to go out. We want to get more recommendations and maybe we don't even know what's going on. Okay, this seems like a decent premise for an app, and there's been a ton of activity in the app space, uh, on the event space. Of, of this would be fall under event discovery, mm -hmm. uh, and it would be personalized. Great. Um, so one way is you could take a commission on the transactions. Uh, so this would be most people would put this either under affiliate revenue, where you take a percentage of each transaction. Another way to do that that would be in the advertising bucket. So affiliate revenue is one. Another way to do it would be to say, every time we send you a lead or somebody clicks on the page, we'll charge you. So that would be cost per click or cost per acquisition. Uh, so a lead, CPL. Those are the advertising models. And the most obvious of the advertising model would be to feature somebody at the top. So you might see Yelp where they say, hey, this restaurant is featured. Or when you're looking at a map, you see like one of the logos is a little bit bigger. That's called a featured listing. So that falls under advertising and marketing. Another way you could do this is you could charge the customers a subscription like Com does mm -hmm. uh, for a pro subscription or Netflix does. And so you could say, you know what? This provides so much value that we're going to charge you 10 bucks per month or 50 bucks a year if you buy it yearly to get this great stuff. Just like somebody might charge for a Time Out magazine subscription. The Village Voice gave you, or the local newspaper sometimes gave it for free, and they were ad-based. Other ones charged for the magazine, and you, you, um, and some of those they did both, right? But it's going to be one of those. I'm trying to think if I can think of another business model you could lay on top. What of What about this. thinking through how do you start testing? You know, so whether you would charge subscription mm. versus you know trying the advertising route. How do you think you would recommend a founder try to test out which sure which channel to go through or which so, path to go down? In order to charge for a subscription, a person has to get significant value and there can't be free options. Eight Sleep is the first bed engineered to improve your sleep and sleep is correlated with success and performance. It is critically important that you get a good night's sleep, especially as a founder or a startup team employee. Eight Sleep has four layers of premium foam with an active grid technology and that gives you pressure relieving support. You also have temperature control so you can have precision crafted components circulate water through the active grid to keep you at the perfect temperature all night. Dynamic thermoregulation on each side of the bed, so you can have two different temperatures. This learns what temperature keeps you asleep and which one will keep you asleep with fewer interruptions. This optimizes the time you're already spending in bed and makes your sleep deep and calming and rejuvenates you for the next day when you have to go to your startup and kick ass. You need to sleep well. This is a thermal alarm. This wakes you up nice and naturally and gradually without the sound of an alarm. As the bed cools down, your heart rate speeds up just slightly to keep your body temperature up, and this will make you wake up organically, nice and smooth. And sleep fitness. High-tech sensors track sleep time and sleep phases, so you can review your sleep report every morning in the 8Sleep app. And you get an AI sleep coach, which will give you advice based upon your data. You can also control the bed temperature through your Alexa, Google Home, all that kind of stuff. You can be like, hey, Alexa, make my bed temperature this, that, or the other thing. Whatever you like. So get the sleep you deserve by heading to 8sleep.com slash twist and supercharge your health and productivity. 8, E-I-G-H-T, sleep.com slash twist. You can try the product free for 100 days at 8 Sleep dot com slash twist that's right try the product risk free for 100 days in your home at eight sleep.com slash twist okay let's get back to this amazing episode so when pay tv came out let's say hbo it had to be so much better as an offering than mm -hmm. free abc and nbc mm -hmm. tv for people to pay so what did they offer you no commercials well that has value right i don't have to sit through commercials and then Oh, if it's an R-rated movie, we don't censor it. Okay, well, that adds value. Uh, if there was a horror film or if it's you know, adult content, and actually they did have even maybe uh, not adult adult content, but they maybe had some you know, uh, softcore kind of stuff. That was stuff people were willing to pay for. So it's an analogy like that. And I think one of the problems in this space is you can find a lot of event listings on Google and other places. I don't know that people will be willing to pay for it. So that experiment would likely fail in my mind, but you never know. Maybe it wouldn't 
because people did pay for Zagat, which mm -hmm. was the restaurant listing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did they pay for Zagat? Well, Zagat had metrics associated with it, and they really put a lot of process into it. Consumer Reports also got people to pay. Mm -hmm. If you want people to pay for Consumer Reports, the reason Consumer Reports has the ability to get subscribers, uh, and Zagat did, is because it really helped the most passionate people make decisions, and those decisions had money associated with it. So, as an example, if you're gonna pick high-end restaurants, that's a big decision because you might have a bad experience. You might be spending hundreds of dollars. And then if you look at Consumer Reports, people bought Consumer Reports, and I'm a subscriber to it. I buy that because I don't want to make a mistake on a high-end piece of electronics or an appliance. It's really the appliance business, I think, is what makes it happen. Um, so this is a very challenged one, and it's a very simple. You, you would start with um, maybe having a free product. Mm -hmm. that could You could do a time-based trial. Here's 30 days, and after 30 days, you have to pay, and you'd find out pretty quickly. And I don't think it would work. It'd be pretty hard. Um, and the other way to do it is um, you, you could just charge from the beginning and say, hey, here are the 10 best this weekend. Mm. This is the seven tonight. And you're going to get it. So a paid newsletter. And we see this. Uh, there's a newsletter company, not inside.com, but one called Substack. And Substack is like a kind of like a Patreon mm. that allows people to start their own paid newsletters for five bucks a month. If somebody was like Jonathan Gold, I think in Los Angeles was a famous food critic. If someone like that charged, some number of people would pay, just like some number of people would pay for Patreon. So that's a new patronage is kind of a new yeah. spin on mm -hmm. it. So the mm -hmm. patronage might work in that model too. Yeah. Advertising would be very hard because you have a super fragmented space. You have low dollar amounts. It's not like we're buying cars here or college educations <laughs> or homes. Mm -hmm. So I think advertising would be super hard. And you look at Yelp, they have to have hundreds of $35,000 a year salespeople making 10K on plan in Arizona to get restaurants. And then they make a South Park episode about <laughs> all the tricks or games people claim Yelp makes to try to get that sale. So it feels a little icky, right? So yeah. this is it. This is a business idea that's incredibly hard and many people have tried. Yeah. But you can see there's a small number of ways. And sometimes what a business model tells you is reality. Mm. And a lot of times founders are scared. Mm. Humans are scared, right? Like fear drives a lot of people. And we have to, as a group, uh, as managing directors and myself as the, um, the GP here, we have to get over our fear and make bets with cash to invest in companies, right? And we have scary moments like, oh my God, we made a mistake or we're gonna lose that money. Um, I think the founders also have that fear of, I have this idea for an event business, but maybe it's not good enough for people to pay and that's scary. So what do they do? What do we see them do in that situation when they're scared to charge? Uh, don't charge typically? They don't charge. And then they, who are, who's paying for the product then? Investors. There. Investors. So now you have an investor supported business where people actually aren't ready. And this is a big controversy, uh, say, with uh, Uber and Lyft now. They're saying, oh my God, they're subsidizing the rides. Well, if you think about Uber and Lyft, if it was one or two dollars more per ride, would it make any difference on consumption? Probably very little because people are not going to walk in the rain. <laughs> you know, the habit's been formed. Yeah. Um, so that's, I always think about the fear. Now, uh, to your original question, a serial captain, a serial founder, um, they know this and they're likely not scared because they've been out at sea. Going out at sea the first time, pretty scary, right? You're like, oh my God, there's sharks, there's some giant octopus, a crack, and we're going to die. It's going to be cannibalism. Um, but somebody who's been out there, they're like, yep, yeah, we're going to hit some storms, but we'll get through them. It's going to be gnarly at times. You might get sick, but yeah, stick with it. We'll be okay. And they just, they know the quicker you get to revenue or the quicker you start charging or the quicker you know it, the easier everything flows. We know how we make money here. We don't try to make money off the podcast or the events. We're very clear about that. We try to make money when one of our startups, 10 years after we invest in it, seven years after we invest in it, goes public or gets bought. Okay, we got through our first slide. We got six to go. We spent a little bit of time on that one, but now it's a pretty easy, basic uh, set of questions we have here that we're going to answer, which is how to charge. Yeah. Okay, we're on the ship. We know our business model. We know our destination. How do we charge? Yeah, so our... General advice here is uh, that you charge customer. The way you charge customers should be simple and obvious to them. Uh, but let's break this up a little bit between enterprise and consumer businesses. So, uh, Jackie, what do you see as the most common way, uh, common ways to charge? 
Yeah, I think that um, for B2B, the most common that I've seen is SaaS, software as a service. Um, and within that, there are many different ways to do it. I mean, you have freemium, which uh, is both free and paid, and you're hoping to convert uh, the free users to upgrade them to the paid to the paid subscriptions. Um, charging one price, uh, flat rate, uh, tiered also, different premium business for different, and then per user also, mm-hmm. so per seat. Yep. Um, and then in, there's advertising, obviously, as we see with Facebook and Google. Um, white label, where we're selling, uh, you can sell unbranded software to companies who then brand it themselves. Um, and then in the B2C space, there's subscription, which has seemed to be more and more popular these days. In-app pur- purchases, which is really more common with gaming. A marketplace, obviously, the connecting providers of a service with those looking for the service, like a babysitting site, you're connecting the parents and the sitters. And then in that case, you could charge the parent or the sitter a fee or a membership fee or take a percentage of a transaction. Um, and then there are other models like B2B2C or revenue <laughs> share. Um, so I feel like those are the, the main ones. And I'm curious, uh, Jason, of these options, which do you see as the most ex- successful like i yeah. i have noticed subscription businesses are seem to be very hot right now <laughs> well and, and i think it's worth unpacking why yeah and we we alluded to it earlier with the com.com discussion but you could bring slack into this discussion as well we're not investors in slack unfortunately but we use the product and love it and if you look at something like slack they only charge you for the customers who use that product for the month so there's a super innovation so there's two levels of innovation in the old days, it would be client server. You would spend five hundred thousand dollars installing Slack at your office, making taking maybe six months to install it, and maybe it took six months before that to pick the winner. And it was, you know, somebody who was the CTO or CIO in some ivory tower would pick the software on a golf course or at a Knicks game. Literally, that's how it worked in the nineties, uh, and that's why companies like Microsoft had these huge sales teams or Oracle. They would sell into some CXO, some top leader, a huge multi-million dollar deal. And then what they realized was, you know what? If you just put your credit card in and you only get charged for what you use, it reduces the friction. You don't Mm -hmm. have to go to the CXO because some VP in marketing or in sales might say, you know what? It's $8 per month per user. I'm putting five people on this. I I have buying authority for that. I'll do bottoms up procurement. I'll just put it on my corporate card. I don't have to ask for permission. And so that took out friction. And really the name of the game is, I think, and Demont, you talked about this as simplicity. How Mm -hmm. simple is it? And then how little friction there is. Subscriptions remove all friction. With some notable exceptions, ever try to cancel your cable subscription (laughs) or the Wall Street Journal? I've had, or Verizon or any of these companies, like, they have made it a high art to obscurify the unsubscription process. And I believe you can tell the quality of a product and a company by how easy it is. This is Jason's law. You can tell the quality of a product or a company based upon how easy it is to return the product or cancel your subscription. Mm -hmm. I tried to cancel the Wall Street Journal. They made me call them. And it was a 15-minute process. And I could tell they were trying to get me to give up. And I just said, listen, I have to get off the phone right now. I'm recording the phone call. I lied. I said, I'm recording this phone call. I'm going to publish it if you do not cancel it in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> and this poor woman who I was like haranguing was like, okay, sir, I just need one more minute. I was like, okay, I am going to time you one more minute. I have to get off this call. I've got to go pick up my kids from school. Again, it was another lie. But I found myself having to lie and negotiate canceling the product. And it just has turned me off. And if you look recently, Apple offered a news product which was subscription, Apple News Plus, I think they called it, and it included the Wall Street Journal. The entire discussion on social media, on Twitter, was I'm canceling my Wall Street Journal subscription and I'm going to sign up through Apple because unsubscribes are simpler. So back to simplicity, Mm -hmm. demand, which is an excellent point. People now perceive that they should be able to, if they don't like the product, get out of it anytime or pause it. Gym memberships are another one that they create massive friction. I had an Equinox membership and they they were like, you can only cancel this if you prove to us you've moved. And I was like, okay. And I just went to my desk and said, this person's moving. I wrote it. I'm the CEO of the company and I bring it. I'm moving. And okay, you got to bring us your electric bill. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is getting ridiculous. Like, cancel my subscription. They just try to throw up those Roblox. That's why subscriptions have taken over. You don't have to outlay it. And I also think the millennial generation and Gen Z, which are commitment phobic or or 
they're wise about commitments. Mm -hmm. Either way you look at it, I mean, the, the negative way to look at it would be these millennials are scared of making commitments. The actual positive one is they're not stupid enough to make commitments that they can't <laughs> actually fulfill or that they want to fulfill. So Uber uh, actually started that too with Lyft, right? And Uber and Lyft, you're, you don't have to make a full commitment. I'm, I'm buying a car. I could just use Lyft in as much as I want or public transportation if I don't have money. So mm -hmm. that's why subscriptions are kind of yeah. in vogue. And nobody really knew that it would work in the enterprise, but it creates so much clarity for your organization when you know that every time somebody leaves, it's easy for them to leave, and maybe they'll tell you why. So knowing your churn, churn, C-H-U-R-N, churn, right? I spelled mm -hmm. it right? Yeah. Correct. Churn is another North Star, or maybe it's the Big Dipper, you know? Like, so you're, you're trying to use your, what do they call that thing? Uh, the device you would use when you're sailing. It's like a pro, it looks like a protractor, but you look through it. Yeah, Sir know. Charles will put it in the <laughs> chat room for me, but there's a term for that thing that you would look through at the stars and you'd be able to navigate. Yeah. Uh, it's like a compass, I guess, uh, of sorts. But that is another North Star. Churn is a North Star. Right. And another North Star becomes with subscriptions, land and expand or negative net churn yep. or negative churn. Negative churn. Why do people say negative net churn? Uh, I've heard that. I, I guess they mean overall. Yeah, a sexton. So, Charles says it's a sexton, that device okay. that you oh, use when you're on a ship. Uh, never heard of that. Um, <laughs> insert a sexton right here. Um, <laughs> But anyway, that negative churn is when you have more people subscribing than unsubscribing to your product. So you have Slack and the number of customers is going, your churn. No, so there's number of seats. So number of be, seats. So you would look at, so if Slack had a certain number of, uh, the no, total number of customers they had, let's say at the beginning of the month, of those 100 customers, did they do they pay more or less at the end of the month? Right. And so you'll lose customers, so you may have fewer customers, so maybe you only have 97 customers at the end of the right. month. Right, you lost three names. But those 97 customers, on average, pay more per customer. They added more seats. They added more seats, and thus you had negative churn because right. you now, those 97 customers paid more than the 100 yeah. So the number of, of the customers month. you had, sextant, S-E-X-T-A-N-T, -E Charles says. Okay, thank you, Sir Charles. Um, so that's negative trend. So that's why subscriptions, I think, Jackie, really help because you get all this incredible metrics. And there's a cohort of tools now, I guess, um, I think one's called Bear Metrics or mm, something yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that I've seen some startups use. But you know, if you use Stripe or any of these online, you, you get an idea of who's unsubscribing and at what velocity, and you can actually make changes to your product. And yep. sometimes it will tell you about seasonality. We know Fitbod and Calm, two of our really great subscription investments, do really well in January. Why? Why do they do well in January? <laughs> New Year's resolutions. Yep. Correct. <laughs> and so now you've got seasonality in it, right? So that's, I think, a really great one. Hmm. Yeah. Great. So startups should increase price over time. So this sounds like a good strategy to start modest, um, but then get more aggressive as you're building your product. Um, Demont, when when should founders think about increasing prices? Yeah. So the answer we tell founders is they should always uh, be thinking about in increasing pricing. And one of the most common mistakes that we see founders make is not realizing how much value that they're continually adding to the product every single day that they're building the product. Um, and so what we typically ask founders to do in an exercise is to think about what the product and experience was like uh, when they first started charging uh, their customers. What, what was that at the current price? What was the product like at the beginning? Then think about, okay, how much time has your engineering and product teams added to the product? How many features have they right. shipped? How many additional things have they added? The support team, what was it like when you first started charging that price? What is it like now? How much better is your support? Right. Does your support 24-7 like Squarespace, let's say? Right. And, and maybe was it, it at used the beginning, to be just business hours. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and then you think, okay, am I charging for those things? All those things are adding value to your customers. They're saving time. Uh, they're saving their, your customers money. And are you charging for them? Right. And I, it's... Amazing to me, a, a startup that wants to double revenue in the next six months can literally, the easiest way to do that is to double their prices or triple their prices, let's say, triple. Let's go with triple. Yep. Triple your prices and see 10% or 20% of your customers go away. So if there was 80% left, 80 customers, if you triple the price on 80 customers and they're paying a dollar each, you went from $100 to 
Now you've lost 20 customers for paying a dollar each. You got $80, but you tripled the price. Now you're at $240. So you have 2.4 extra revenue. And you got rid of the customers who probably you forced them to make a decision who weren't getting value. So you've actually gotten rid of the people who are going to churn anyway. And one of the things we often notice about the customers that are paying the least, they are the most demanding. Oh, they're uh, pains in the asses. Yeah. And it, so it ultimately, they are the most expensive customer to also serve. <laughs> and despite the fact that they are paying the least They're amount. annoying. Yep. I mean, my dad, I was always telling my dad when I was a kid, like, why don't we do two for one? I saw two for one. He's like, I don't want those customers in here. <laughs> they come in, they order four things of bread. They don't order alcohol. They drink water. They split an entree. So they'll, they'll get two for one entrees. They won't order appetizers or dessert. And they stay in the seat for four hours and they they burn, you know, they're just, they're annoying and they don't give good tips. So why would we have them in the restaurant? And, you know, there was a business called Groupon, which actually, uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a business called Groupon. <laughs> uh, and Groupon, their speciality was taking businesses that were maybe struggling a little bit and saying, hey, we'll get you a thousand new customers. And, you know, a yoga studio would be like, well, that sounds great. I, I need customers, a thousand. And they were literally like deal a-holes and these deal seekers <laughs> would come in and be annoying and they would come one time and then mm -hmm. you wouldn't see them for six months and they come back when they got a three dollar yoga class and it was just not none of them converted right. so almost universally raised your prices um and we had actually the who was the founder who just spoke at the accelerator uh, was it segment? Yeah, segment. Mm -hmm. Yep. What's the founder's name? I forgot. All Peter. Peter. Peter Reinhardt. And so that was like a really, Peter gave a great talk and he kept doubling his prices and he had his customers at segment telling him, your, your product is too cheap. Charge us more. And uh, it worked out really well for him. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Segment's done tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk tactics. Um, so founders want to increase their prices. What are some common ways to do this? Yeah. Um, so... <clears throat> Again, it's helpful to break this up in, uh, like we did previously, B2C, B2B. Mm -hmm. So th with B2C, the most common thing we typically see companies do is they'll uh, grandfather uh, their customers yes. in. Um, so what that generally looks like on a tactical basics, a basis is they'll send an email to their customers or maybe even a letter, uh, give them a heads up that prices are increasing typically today. And so they'll say, our prices are increasing today for new customers. Ah. For new customers only. As a loyal customer, you're, we're going to keep you at your current price for three months, maybe six months, maybe even a year. Right. Um, and or till the end of this year. Or till the end of this year, whatever whatever it may be. And Amazon Prime, I think, is a, a pretty common example of this. They've raised What do they prices. charge now? $149? $129? Yeah, I think it's $129. It started at $49 or $59. Yeah, yeah. And I'm they not... have been boiling the frog. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm not even sure what I pay for it. I just keep paying. You know, <laughs> well, how could you not? I mean, <laughs> it's like, I can get stuff in two days. It's the perfect example of adding more value because- right. Back to that point about right. how much value you've added, they are now doing same day. Mm -hmm. They give you Amazon Video for free. Yep. I think they give you a music service yep. that's music. sort of free. Yeah, no, it's, I actually use it. I like it. They started wardrobe, no, prime cool. wardrobe. Jamal's super cheap. He's like, I'm not paying for Spotify. <laughs> I'll give you one of my extra family plans. Oh. <laughs> prime Appreciate wardrobe. It. They started that. What is that? Um, you, it's, it's you can try out things before you buy them. So they'll oh. send you a box of clothes, and then you can have you used return. it. I have. Is it good? It is good. Wow. It is good. It's oh, not okay. as fun as just getting them and returning them, but hmm. it's a, yeah. That's a neat thing, yeah. <laughs> so providing more value yep. gives you the ability to refresh. And I like that uh, that style because they're increasing today. You're like, your anxiety goes up. Oh my God, what? And it's like, but you're not part of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like we upgraded you to business class, right. but nobody else. Yeah. You got the upgrade. Nobody yeah. else did. Don't tell anybody. Right. Yeah. Um, so on the enterprise side, what we will see c uh, companies sometimes do the grandfathering tactic as well. Uh, another very common one is releasing a new, f uh, releasing new features in a new tier as well. So, yes. um, so you may have, you know, kind of two. You may start off with two tiers, and then you're going to add a premium enterprise uh, tier yeah. uh, as well. So. Um, one of the examples that we've seen uh, for for that one is Lead IQ. Um, ah. So Lead IQ, uh, as an example, started off as 
looking for email addresses for your uh, SDRs, for your SDRs, sales for your sales development, for right. your sales people. Yeah. Um, and then they realized, well, what are they doing with those email addresses? They're plugging them to other tools. They are uh, sharing them with their teammates. And so building those features, adding those, yes. uh, adding those things allowed Enterprise them to- Enterprise features, we allowing, call those. Yep. Uh, another way to say tier. it is multiplayer mode. Yep. So, uh, and I think Slack's was- because Slack was free for a certain number of users, mm -hmm. but you couldn't go more than 10,000 messages That's in your right. archive. And what I really love about Slack's approach was they would just put it at the top of the screen. It was a permanent message that says like, you are now over 10,000. And maybe you could clear it. I don't know if you could clear it or not. But it told you like, hey, you're, it's basically like your DVR is full up. Would you like a larger TiVo, right? Yeah. Like it's super smart. I mean, this is also what happens with iTunes. If you're uh, iCloud storage mm -hmm. hits its max. They tell you like, hey, you're at your max. You can delete photos or press here and go from $1.99. <laughs> and that's the one that gets me super upset because if you think about aggressive pricing, like I think they were like, you could have 10 gig, 50 gig, 100 gig, or one terabyte. And I'm like, I, can, is there something in between? And they're like, nope, you can go from like $2 a month to 10. I'm like, how about five? Like, why doesn't it go up every hundred? And they're like, no, nope, we know you're a power user. So I literally pay 10 bucks a month for two terabytes on iTunes. And then I can share it with my family. But it shows you to this point of like, consumers are willing to pay more mm -hmm. for value. Because yep. I thought about it and I said, well, my other option is to get external hard drives and a RAID array <laughs> and have to manage it. And then offload stuff, which will be an hour every couple of months. Well, an hour of my time is worth a lot of money. I mean, yep. Why would I ever sit there for four hours when I can pay $100 a year and have it taken care of? So right. saving people time is just really amazing. And then you can also keep your prices the same price and add value and reduce churn. So there is that option sure. too. If you think about com.com, I saw them add sleep stories and some other courses. And I think the price stayed the same. So what that does is it just makes it more sticky. So every time Netflix comes out with a new series or HBO, they're building their library. So before Game of Thrones, HBO had some level of value, but now post Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones gets added to The Wire and Deadwood and Westworld and Sopranos. Yeah. So you can always go back to those archives. It's and I think that's about, why Disney's going to do so well. Yeah. It's also about expanding the customers that you can attract too. So if you, oh, right. if meditation wasn't, or if Game of Thrones wasn't your show and then you know the next one was. And so anyway. Right. You might be, I mean, I think, that's one of the things that made Netflix so successful. They're like, well, we're just going to own comedy. Mm -hmm. So they, right. and if you're into stand up comedy, it's like, well, how do you not have it? I mean, every month there's five, 10 new, maybe 10 new stand up shows. Right. And I like watching those sometimes. Um, but if you're not into it, well, they're putting Friends and old series on there that you, if you're like retro TV, you can, you, you got something there too. You already know Zendesk is the world's best customer support system, but what you may not know is that they have an entire range of products called the Zendesk Suite, which offer a simple yet powerful solution that makes it easy for customers to engage with your business. This includes integrated customer support, a knowledge base, live chat, which everybody loves when you go to a website and you can chat with somebody, as well as a call center. With all your support channels connected in one place, conversations become seamless, agents are more productive, and the information can be shared across your company. Now you can scale your business without needing to hire a bunch of people. And with flat rate pricing, it's very startup friendly. We use it here. Grant has used it before, uh, who is our director of partnership. He uses Zendesk and loves it specifically. All the customer interaction in one place. That's super critical so you don't lose anything. And other customers who love it, Peloton, Slack, Airbnb, Latote. These are some of the top companies in the world, and they are using Zendesk. So here is your call to action. Qualifying startups, this means Series B or below, under 100 employees, which I think is a fair definition, can join Zendesk's startup program and get Zendesk products for free for a full year. Wait, what? Free? What are you waiting for? Go to Zendesk.com slash twist. And if you have under 100 employees and you're Series B or below, you will get Zendesk for free for a year. Zendesk.com slash twist. I don't know how long this amazing offer is going to last. So go to Zendesk.com slash twist and get it now. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, moving on to our third of seven slides and points we want to talk about on our Scaling Your Startup series, the third episode, and we're on the third slide. 
uh, when to charge. And we have the deck online. This week in startups. We do. Dot com slash scale. scale. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So you can see this deck and the deck is a living document. I think it's in Google Slides or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so if you see a mistake in it or have something you want to punch up, leave a comment for us. Please. Please. <laughs> so founders often ask us when is the right time to turn on monetization. Uh, so Jackie, what have you seen as best practices in terms of to begin charging? I think that uh, turning on revenue earlier than you're comfortable with um, is a good standard. I know Eric Reese has said this in Lean Startup, um, charge customers from day one. And Jason, you have said this a lot. Um, it's kind of an understandable chicken and egg sort of dilemma. You know, founders may want to delay charging um, to see how their product does before they start charging customers. Um, but one of our companies, Fitbod, I know, the fitness training app, um, they decided to charge early and they've done very well. They have hockey stick growth as a result. So I think the bottom line is if you know you've built something of value, then then charge for it. And if you haven't built something of value, well, that's on you. Yeah. And back to fear and back to, I think, founder psychology, pricing and charging what you're worth um, is... I, I think it's two sides of the same coin. Like if you're building a great product, those companies we've seen consistently have no problem charging for it. And then almost universally, the person who doesn't want to charge, it's because their product isn't actually solving a big enough problem or delighting mm-hmm. customers enough. Mm-hmm. Nobody has a problem charging for superhuman or paying for superhuman. Mm-hmm. It saves you time. And the power email users, the top 1% of the you know 5 billion people using email, those 50 million people will pay forever in my mind. And do you think that the older way of monetizing, waiting, like Facebook and Twitter, they waited, do you think that's out of vogue completely? That's a great question. You know, these were moments in time. Those companies had hockey stick growth uh, that was just never seen before. And they knew how they were going to build their ad networks. Mm. In both cases, they created a new advertising model. So it's worth pausing for a second Mm. to just consider that. Neither one was doing display advertising, right? That was banner ads. Banner ads had existed for a decade or more in both cases. What Google said is, we want to do intent-based search ads, a new category. You type in what you want, and we match you with an ad that somebody has bid on in an auction. This was revolutionary at the time. Mm. The idea that you would say, I'm going to go find somebody who wants to reach a customer who typed in used Volvo Santa Monica. There's a small number of people who want that. It's like 50 car dealers in Southern California. So there's a pool of 50 people who really want that search and they're in competition with each other and they started an auction. So it took actually a little while for them to build that software. And they were growing so fast with such a great product that the venture capitalists, in that case, Sequoia uh, and Kleiner Perkins said, you've got plenty of money. Why don't you keep working on the product, it's obviously going to work. You can't have this many people. So if you have unbelievable hockey stick growth and you have the greatest investors in the world telling you keep going, that's a fine thing to do. Let's think of the next example, Facebook. They had world-class investors, Peter Thiel Founders Fund, or even before Founders Fund had a name, uh, and Excel, and they had unlimited capital. And they too were going to start a new type of Um, advertising that I didn't think would work, which was advertising based on interrupting somebody in a social network in a chat room to put an ad in there based upon their profile data. So you're going to try to get all of the single moms in Florida over the age of 40 to sell them some specific type of clothes and all the you know, gay men in New York who are, you know, interested in a certain type of whatever, shoes or something. It was just like a crazy concept. And I remember hearing it and I was like, that's just crazy. And now it's happening to the extent that people are picking like really tight, tight uh, psychographics on there. In both of those cases, they were building some new ad model. It was still advertising, still selling to marketers, but really revolutionized an industry. Instagram would fall into that category as well. Mm -hmm. uh, And YouTube would. Mm -hmm. Both, and if you look at those four, it was a moment in time when things were just growing really fast. Uh, And it just made sense. There was no doubt that it was going to hit that. So if you're building a content business or something like that, that's going to be ad-based, there is, uh, if it's ad-based, there is something to getting scale first and then doing it. Mm. 
Right now in Silicon Valley, 90% in the last couple of years of the additional dollars going into advertising went to the duopoly of Facebook and Google. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Google has Google search plus Android plus YouTube, and Facebook has Facebook plus Instagram. And WhatsApp. And WhatsApp, which I don't know if it has ads in it yet. Oh. It may not have ads yet, but anyway, it will, and yeah. all of the, but it, and it also gives them psychographic data, so it's it's part of the whole advertising bundle. Yeah. So in those cases, now people are saying if we can't compete with them, let's charge. So the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and other content sites, uh, podcasts even are saying, you know what, let's see if we can charge right uh, and do the patronage model. So yeah. this is why what business model worked previously may change over time uh, and fall in and out of fashion with investors. So now that we've um, established that we want to turn revenue on early, um, how you have to decide how much. So DeMont, <laughs> what are some of the best ways to figure out how much to charge? Sure. Um, so again, I think it's helpful to think about this between B2B and B2C just because going to market is pretty different for, for both uh, cases. So one of the my favorite ways to uh, talk with a B2B founder about uh, figuring out how to price the product is something I call a flinch test. And so this is something that needs to be done in person. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're with your customer in a meeting and you can come you know, towards the end of it and you're talking about price um, and perhaps they ask you, you, you could say, we charge $10,000 and, and then you stop talking. And if they flinch, uh, you can ah. either stick with that number or backpedal. So if they flinch, then you could say, oh, for the first two months or for the first quarter ah. or for the first month, then it drops down to $5,000 um, and you can rinse and repeat. But what most often happens is you say that number and the customer says, oh, and then they write down the number and you have just increased your prices most likely. You should have just increased your price right. because that's what they you should always- flinch. They yeah. didn't flinch. They just say yes. Yes. And it's like, well- Then you yeah. have a, a, new, a new baseline to do the next one with. Yeah. And- I think it's important to understand sometimes you sometimes you want to charge a price that gets somebody on board to get some data. Uh, so as an example, we had this Angel University. We charge five hundred dollars for it. Mm -hmm. We have to travel around across the country to get there. We break <laughs> even on it, and we take them to dinner, which costs whatever hundred, two hundred dollars a person. So there's not, but we could probably charge five thousand for that, but we don't because we're looking at that as a a partnership acquisition because we want those people to send us deal flow and send us companies and participate in investing in our companies. So you also have to know what is the lifetime value of a customer, right? right? And here, if you get them on board for the base level product, but you know in your mind like multiplayer mode where like 25 people can collaborate is going to be $150 per month per person. You can feel okay giving them the twenty-five dollar per month per person single player mode. Yeah, start off. Uh, with and I think actually, if you think about Salesforce and some of the other sales tools out there, I think they're in that hundred fifty a month range, mm -hmm. two hundred dollars yep. a month range, yep. which is extraordinary. It used to be that Microsoft Office, I believe, was three hundred dollars, and you one would, time, one time, yeah. And then your company, after three or four years, would upgrade the license, and you get a new license. You have to reinstall it, uninstall the old one. It was a pain in the neck. Yeah. And that's why the subscription revenues turned out better. Mm -hmm. And the, the leading company that they thought was um, really going to collapse and it did the opposite was Adobe. The creative suite, they were charging, yep. I think, upwards of $1,000 for Photoshop yep. and all the Illustrator and that whole Adobe suite. And I think they went to $25 yep. per creative cloud, yep. 300 yep. a year. Yep. And their business has been on fire because people yep. are like, it's only $25 a month. <laughs> and they don't realize, well, you're going to have it for 100 months over the next 10 years, right? right? So 12 months <laughs> yeah. is whatever that is, right? Uh, it's 12, yeah, it's gonna be 1,200 months at $25. No, right. uh, 120 months at $25. So you're gonna be talking about a lot of money. Yeah. Right. Uh, you wind up spending 300 a year, it's gonna be $3,000 over 10 years. Yep. Which is probably what they made anyway. Yeah, they probably people upgraded three times or four times over a decade. Yeah. Yeah, but they didn't have to print all those CDs and send them to you and boxes <laughs> and do marketing to convince you. Because yeah. once you get somebody, like who's unsubscribing from Calm or Netflix right. or Amazon Prime as we discussed? Like yeah. you're gonna be on it for life. And then yeah. you start thinking Amazon Prime at $100 a year for 30 years. 
three thousand dollars you're giving to Amazon. That's, I think it's their north star now is Amazon Prime. They make a lot of their decisions based on that. Okay, let's go to our fourth. We're cooking with oil now. Revenue streams. So we've talked uh, a lot about different ways to charge. Um, so Jackie, let's answer. Let's start off with a basic question of how many stream revenue streams should you have? Right, and so the answer is one. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler um, alert. Two. Um, I think. You have too many streams and it's too confusing. Um, our advice here is really to pick one revenue stream and double down on it. Otherwise, you get kind of conflicting motivations. Um, I've, Inside your organization. Yeah. And with your customers. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Um, and we see this with, with newspapers, for example. They charge for they paywalls and have advertising and those conflict. Um, advertisers and sales, they want as many eyeballs as possible. So. Um, yeah, they're like, why is this... If you look at the Washington Post, they've done this incredible coverage of the Mueller report and Trump and everything, and they uh, charge. And the advertising department, if they had one, they, they just made a decision, we're going to live or die with subscriptions. Yeah. But New York Times, they haven't made that decision. They've got the advertising department. So if they're doing a breaking news story and they can get 10 million impressions for Mercedes at whatever, $50 per thousand, like they're leaving a lot of money on the table if they don't get it. It's a half million dollar ad buy. Uh, and that really does distract you. And we have this internally right now. We have a Patreon for This Week in Startups, and we have advertising. And we believe we'll convert, let's call it 1,000 people, 2,000 people to the paid. So it'll be kind of fun to have it. But we're even internally like, oh, we forgot about Patreon. Let's make sure we do something nice for them. Oh, no, we got the advertiser. We got to do something nice for them. Yeah. So it can. if you don't have enough resources in your company, you're going to do both poorly. Right. right now we're doing our free product exceptionally. And I would say our Patreon product is okay. And over the next six months, if you guys keep subscribing, we're going to make it great. But it's, it even takes us time and we're cognizant of we're going through this dissonance right now. <laughs> this is the example of cognitive dissonance right. for right. sure. Right. Um, and there are exceptions. Sure there are. So some companies naturally have more than one revenue stream. IoT devices, they sell a physical product and there's one time price, but then they have a soft start subscription to power it. Um, and I think another interesting exception in our own portfolio, and Jason, I'm curious about your take on this, um, Kush. Uh, yes. Yeah, they're, they started at and built a successful media company, but they ultimately wanted to build a marketplace yeah. based for wholesale cannabis. So they used the revenue and the network from the tourism side to do that. So given uh, that we recommend founders focus on one revenue stream, you know, what advice would you have for other yeah. founders in similar situation about what to charge and what? Let's keep our analogy of exploring, uh, of the founders as explorers going. Yeah. Let's say we get to the new world and you're like, okay, we can put a bunch of stuff on the ship and go back to Queen, uh, go back to the Queen in Spain and give her whatever we found, a bunch of like otter pelts. <laughs> or we can stay in America and head west. And you head west and all of a sudden you find all this open land and buffalo and you find oil and you find gold and you find beachfront real estate. And you say, you know what? We went on this journey and we found something better. Mm -hmm. And this is the constant creative tension that can happen. And I, I'll give you a, a, another analogy uh, to keep this going. It, and I think the Kush one is fine. They, they realized they had this million dollar media business, but they also realized that they knew exactly how big it would get. We could double it every year for mm -hmm. five years and get to 10 million. Mm -hmm. But what would a marketplace for cannabis products, you know, an enterprise level marketplace for legal cannabis in legal markets, what would that look like? Well, if this much cannabis is moving and we're taking this percentage of it, well, that would be incredible. And so, uh, you know, they they did the right thing and said, let's deprecate that. And if, in fact, if you think about us here at Launch, we had Launch Festival as a conference, and we weren't investing in the companies. And David Sachs said to me at one point, like, Jason, you found Yammer, you put us on stage, you made us famous, and you owned no equity. Start a fund, I'll be your anchor LP, and he gave me some money to start the fund. Mm. And then we started investing in the companies. And now you look at a company like Com, which would have normally been on the podcast, been at our events, and that would have been the end of it. And now instead of just them being on the podcast and being at an event, we own whatever, 6% of the company, and it's worth a billion dollars, and we get 20% of the growth of that. So we can make $10 million from an investment like that or more. Mm -hmm. It's a much better business to be in. So I said, you know what? Let's stop charging for tickets to the events. Let's get as many founders there as possible. We don't need to charge for this. We need to find the next calm or the next Robinhood. 
And so it's very wise for you to do that. And the other piece to this exception is, for the love of God, if you find oil, don't pivot. <laughs> so, you know, we pivoted because we found oil. It was so clear to us that Dropbox, Yammer, Fitbit, Mint, Mint, all launched, and we became very close friends with the founders, but we didn't have equity in them. And they offered us to buy equity in them, and we introduced them to investors. So we were like, wait a second, we're idiots. This is a smart pivot. Now, here would be a mistake of a pivot. We're sitting here in 2019, after I've been investing for 10 years, and you guys have been working with me for the last five on it, and we figure out, oh, our accelerator companies and our syndicate companies are doing really well. Let's stop. <laughs> Let's go find another business model. That's the big mistake. Mm. So we've had companies that hit a million dollar run rate and then they take the oil rig and they pull it up and they stop drilling. They're like, I think we got all the oil. I'm like, are you sure you got all the oil? Because if you drill down another mile, there might be, if there was one pocket of oil, maybe there's more, like keep digging in the mine, mm -hmm. in the mine or in the oil well. And so that is uh, something that should be obvious when you're in that moment is keep drilling, keep drilling. And raising your price is one way to keep drilling. Uh, and looking in other markets, who else might want to use this product? So if you're com.com um, or your Fitbod, will, you just had iOS and it's doing great. Well, did you do Android? Okay, did you translate into Spanish? Did you bring it to J Japan? Where else are people doing meditation? So now you're seeing com is going to multiple markets. That's the example of continuing to drill for oil. Um, so it seems a critical part of putting together and executing business model very well is really being able to figure out your unit economics. And this it, is slide five of seven we're going to. Correct. Yeah. Um, so unit economics, the exact costs and revenue of your business, right? So DeMont, what are some best practices for founders to get and stay on top of their unit economics? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so first thing here to start with is we recommend building a simple financial model. Um, so... Uh, you know, I think it's funny, we sometimes hear founders that will brag about, you know, starting a business and not creating business plan, not doing, you know, any sort of financial planning. And this is generally a major mistake. Right. Even if investors don't force you, if somebody's not forcing you, the founder should want to do this. Have a plan. Have a plan. Um, so I'll kind of walk through the basic parts of what a simple financial model would look like. Right. Um, so first, you'd want to start off with top line revenue. Um, so... With top line revenue, we typically recommend thinking about them in a couple different scenarios. So one scenario would be your optimistic plan. So let's say you, you would, in an optim, optimistic plan, you're growing 15%, 18%, maybe 20% month over month. Okay, so wow. So that means you're doubling every four months or yep, so. That's your optimistic plan. Yeah. So then you have a more conservative plan. So let's say um, you're growing, you know, six, seven, eight percent month over month. Again, you know, doubling, you know, every 10 months or so. Um, and then you want something in the middle, likely, most likely. So something perhaps 12 percent month over month. So Got that's it. the kind of first part of your uh, simple financial model. So next you want to think about the costs that go into selling your product. Um, so usually at the kind of this level, you would hear, hear them referred to as COGS, cost of goods sold. Hard costs is another way that people will typically refer to them. So examples could be, you know, if you're uh, sending SMS messages and you have API costs through Twilio, something like that. That sure. could be an example of a hard Yeah, every hard time cost. you send a message and it might be a fraction of a penny and you right. send a million and you're spending thousands to tens of thousands yep. of dollars. Got it. Yep. It's hard cost. Sales commission also. Sure. Uh, uh, Sales uh, team typically runs 30% yep. all in. Yep. Marketing to acquire the customers. That customer another service. 30%. Yep. All, all of these are kind yeah. of your, your next bucket, which is the uh, cost of goods sold. And then finally, we've got what most people consider below the line. And so these are kind of your operating costs. So these are salaries, benefits, office space, travel, so forth. So Got that's it. kind of your simple financial Legal model. accounting, yep. Legal accounting. professional services yep. could all fit there. All in there. And if you know this, how does this help you? Sure. Um, so the key th here is to test the assumptions that you're making. So with your growth rate, you've made some assumptions, whether it's whether you, what, what plan will you hit? Conservative, optimistic, uh, the middle one. With marketing, you're going to make some assumptions too. How much mark? How much money do you have to spend on marketing in order to hit those growth rates? Got it. And so the key here is to start tracking these over time and validating which of these assumptions are true mm. um, and which of them are not. And, and maybe you can get better at them too. Exactly. Because you're tracking it. It's, mm -hmm. I, I tell founders, you know, if you get on the scale every day and you weigh yourself, yep. 
you know, it might be a little depressing, but if you get into a rhythm, you might actually get in shape and you might lose the pounds you need to lose. And if it's sales and you have three salespeople doing $10,000 a week, well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out if you want to get to 100,000, you might need 10. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or you might need to double the number, triple the number of calls that each salesperson does so the three salespeople have three times as many phone calls and then they hit 30, $35,000 a week each. That's another way to get to 100,000. But two different strategies there. One is a marketing assumption. We spend more on marketing, we get more inbound leads. The other is brute force, we just throw more bodies at it. Yep. And you can do both. And knowing which one is causing it, that's the big win. Because exactly. if you know what's causing you to win the game, what's causing you to get to the new world on your ship faster than everybody else and safer, you start to figure out the routes and the reps that you need to really to win. So margins. Now we have the business model together, uh, you in economics. So how are you going to expand those margins? <laughs> sure. Um, so... A lot of, most of the time, margin expansion will come with volume. So mm. as you're buying and selling more, uh, you start paying for less. So back to our Twilio example, the more message you send, the less, the less you're going to pay per message. Customer service. If you're buying more seats, you have more customer service. Uh, people on Zendesk, you're going to uh, spend less per seat because you're buying more of them. So you'll start seeing over time that your margin can expand because you're paying less per, per unit. And I think they used to call this economies of scale. Sure. Yep. So if Tesla is making 2,000 Roadsters versus 20,000 Model Ss versus 100,000 Model Xs versus a million Model 3s, you're starting to see with their Model 3 that they really have figured out how to lower the price and maybe even expand the margin on a percentage basis for those uh, over time. The other pieces that we often recommend founders to think about, and we've talked to, about Elite IQ a little bit, is looking at what your how your customers are using your product and trying to figure out how do you drive additional value how do you ultimately charge them more how do you do that and so with going back to kind of our net churn discussion as well so looking at um, how what what additional value can you provide your provide your customers? So if you're using Lead IQ to find email addresses and you're you know copying and pasting them and putting them into a uh, outreach or some other sales automation tool that's sure. automatically sending you emails. Salesforce. Yeah. Can you start building integrations into that? Got it. And then will your customers pay more for that? Right. And or churn less. Or churn less. Right. Exactly. And so that's how you can start uh, upselling your customers and expanding your margins over we time. We had uh, Jackie Des Trainer from Intercom. Mm -hmm. He really understood, I think, this idea of what features matter in some of the talks he did on This Week in oh, Startups. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. a master. At that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, did, he one point he did one of those X Y charts where he's like, "Here's how often people use a feature, mm -hmm. I think, um, and here's how many of your users use it." So, if you were to look at Instagram, 100% of people look at their feed, um, and they do it, you know, the most frequently. Mm -hmm. And then the Explore tab, maybe 20% of your people use it, and maybe they use it 20% of the time. So adding features to the Explore tab, not as good as making the main feed better. Right. So surfacing better content on the main feed would increase engagement. And in fact, if you think about Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, they became so good at one thing, increasing engagement, that it led to all kinds of crazy repercussions for them, whether it was fake news or bullying or hate speech or... Um, you know, on YouTube specifically, people learned how to hack the algorithm a little bit and put bad content into the sidebar. But all of their focus seemed to be on YouTube is how do we get you to just watch one more video? Mm -hmm. And how many times have we all been on YouTube and you're on the right-hand column and you're like, ooh, one more Mark <laughs> Knopfler thing or one more <laughs> knitting video or one more, you know, deleted scene from Star Wars or whatever you're into – they seem to figure it out. And that algorithm, I, they don't even, they can't even explain what it's actually doing. Because yeah. they said, here's all the data. Just test on this huge set of data what increases engagement. And, you know, that is really the high art, I think, of this is there, you're going to have intuition about what features to add. Mm -hmm. And then you can also study data. You can do user interviews. And you can do some combination of that flywheel where you release features, study the data, do the user interviews, watch them work, and then keep 
uh, iterating. And it's important to have a team that loves that process because not everybody does. It can be arduous for the wrong person. Okay, we're in the home stretch now. Seven slides. We're on number six. This is our third part in a 10-part series for scaling your startup. You can visit thisweekinstartups.com slash scale. And I am here with Managing Director Jackie Deegan, who does all of our education, which includes This Week in Startups, this very podcast, at launch, which is our investment company, and Jason DeMont, who uh, manages, is the Managing Director of the Launch Accelerator we have seven companies apply. We have seven companies that get accepted from hundreds of applications. We give them a hundred thousand dollars, and we work with them on these very issues uh, for twelve weeks and twenty sessions, and then hopefully invest more from our syndicate. Okay, let's talk about competitors. We're on slide six of seven. So six point competitors. Yeah, I should add on the accelerator. We don't only work with them for the twelve weeks. We work with them for the life of the company yes. on all these issues. On all these issues, Absolutely. and they do come up. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's where we're getting the knowledge from. Like this yep. is hard fought knowledge. Um, that we're sharing with you. And, and, and this is in our opinions. This comes from scar tissue in a lot of cases and some big victories too. So with competitors, unless you're creating an uh, entirely new market, you're going to have competitors. So uh, Jackie, how much do you think founders should be paying attention to their uh, competitors? Um, well, to use another metaphor, we're moving from uh, boats to cars now. Um, we use a car analogy. So competitors are kind of like your rear view mirror and your customers are more like your windshield. Um, and Jeff Bezos has talked at length about this. He attributes Amazon's success to obsessive compulsive focus on customer over competitor. Um, so I think, uh, Jason, in your experience, um, how can you tell when a founder is not focusing enough on their customers? Like, are there what are the signs of that? Yeah. Some founders don't talk to their customers, which is crazy. Um, maybe they shield themselves from the customer support line. So at one point here, even in our own company, somebody was like, oh, I'll take you off the customer support. I don't want you to be annoyed by that. And I was like, it's like five emails a week. And sometimes it's really interesting stuff. No, I don't want to be taken off the support lines. Please, no. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's usually because a founder is playing the role of founder or CEO and they're not actually passionate about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I always try to be candid with people. Like, is this what you really want to do in life? I love the newsletters I'm doing at inside.com. I read them. I ask the editors to send me, you know, the new features they're doing. And I have opinions on them. I'm not hiding from those opinions. I'm not hiding from the readers and I'm trying to provide value. So I, I told them every newsletter, and we send millions of emails a month, when you hit reply, I want it to go to the editors and to the writer of that newsletter. And so we say in the newsletter, if you have any feedback, hit reply. And I tell people on Twitter, hey, if you got any, if you have somebody you want to have as a guest, at Jason or Jason at Calacanis.com. So I think the founders who don't do it back to fear, they probably are scared that they're not providing enough value for customers. And what they need to do is take the, the bitter pill. They have to go to the doctor. So if you're coughing and you excuse me, you spoke, you smoked for 20 years, like go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, yes, it's probably, it's probably not good. And you need to, the sooner you figure out if you've got lung cancer, the better, right? Like don't delay going to the doctor. And th this happens all the time. People feel like some tingle in their arm and like, I wonder if it's a heart attack. And it's like, don't wonder, call 911, mm -hmm. right? Like this is not the time to wonder. And I think for founders, don't wonder if your customers are getting value. Just go talk to them. Just literally send them a survey. And you may get resistance in your own organization. I had this with inside.com. I was like, I want to send surveys. And there's a big debate about the surveys. It's like, let's not overthink it. Just send them five questions. And Jackie, uh, to your credit here, you are the standard bearer for sending uh, surveys for all of our events. Mm -hmm. And you do a great job of in our staff lunch on Wednesday afternoons, um, where hopefully I get good food. And I think you got... I, I, Good menu selections. I order my own thing. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie orders her own thing. Um, you go through and we rank the speakers. Mm -hmm. And we say, hey, look, this speaker got an 8.9 or 9.2. Well, this person got a 7.4. Why? Oh, this speaker was selling from the stage and they were boring and they didn't come to a rehearsal. And that gave us the ability when we even asked our free customers coming to our events who, you know, our founders we want to we invest in. 
we were able to say, you know what, next year, Des Trainer is such a strong speaker, have him do more. Mm -hmm. Give him twice the amount of time. Instead of a 20 minute slot, give him a 40 minute slot. Or uh, who is it, Mar from Pear mm -hmm. has become like so good at mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, who else have been like the highlight speakers who people just can't get enough of? Jason Lemkin. Lemkin, awesome. amazing, yeah. right? So there's people who prepare and do work, and then there's mm -hmm. people who don't. So this is our way of like really getting attuned to was it worth their time? And then people tell us all the time with our events, oh my God, it was life changing. Oh my God, I, 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 would you refer to a friend? The NPS is off the this. NPS, right. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that later. We're going to do another uh, episode on delighting your customers. So we'll Perfect. talk more about NPS then. Awesome. Okay, so again, main customer, main focus, be customers. Don't <laughs> customers. be scared. Well, I mean, if you're going to do this anyway, don't be scared of your revenue model or your customers. It's fear. It really is fear. So, you know, having said that, even in the rearview mirror, there is something that we can learn from our competitors. Um, Demont, you know, how how should you be paying attention to your competitors? Yeah, the one of the biggest mistakes I see uh, founders make is assuming that their competitor doesn't know what they're doing. Um, or, they're idiots. Yeah, they're idiots. <laughs> they're, they're idiots. Yeah, they, they have no clue. And they've never thought of this feature. <laughs> the other one we see often is they look at a business and they say, oh, that, they're charging way too much for that. Um, and what they don't think about is why are they, why do they have to charge so much for that? Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that we talk a lot about with uh, founders and looking at the companies is charging less, but to charge in a different way. And so one of my favorite examples is Microsoft Word and Excel versus Google Sheets um, and Google Docs. So what Microsoft used to, Microsoft charges for Microsoft Word and Excel, Google Sheets and Google Docs give us away, gives it away for free so that they can monetize you other ways. Yes. Um, and so that's one of uh, one of our favorite examples. Chrome browser uh, and the Microsoft browser, Microsoft did that to Netscape. Netscape was right. charging 50 bucks for a browser yep. and they had all these features and then... Microsoft said, you know what? We'll just build into the operating system. That became the antitrust lawsuit because they bundled it. Um, but the expression people use here, and it's pretty cutthroat in Silicon Valley, is your margin is my opportunity. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking too much of a rake, if you're charging too much, I can come in and charge less and take your customers. We've seen that in the airline business where discount airlines came in and Southwest and I think Ryanair was the one in Europe. Yep. They're charging 50 bucks or 100 bucks for a flight, sometimes 20 bucks. And the competitors don't know what to do, you know, and they're like, oh, my God, we've really got to change things up here. Uh, and that's great. That's a vibrant, competitive landscape. So try their products is my best piece of advice. Some people don't even take mm. the time to try the product. Yeah. <laughs> I would assume they're competent. I would try their product and I would talk to their customers. And here's something that's a little bit, again, back to like Silicon Valley is a little bit um, sharp elbowed. Poaching employees from a competitor or um, interviewing I've heard of people interviewing, mm -hmm. and this is pretty well known here, but you as a new founder might not know this. Sometimes they'll interview your employees with no intention of hiring them, but just to hope that they will, on their own, spill the beans in a job interview. So imagine you're um, you know, one SaaS product and you're going up against Slack and you interview people from Slack and offer them like, oh yeah, this, this pays twice as much as working at Slack and we've got options and they just pump you in for information. It's sort of like espionage. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming it's legal. It feels unethical, but it does happen. So be cognizant of that. Competitive intelligence, very important, very important. Uh, reading the reviews, like if you're up against, if comm is up against Headspace and vice versa, you're gonna need to read the reviews of your competitor and say, what do people love about Headspace versus comm? And should we be thinking about adding that product? And sometimes, a product will set the standard. So if you're Walmart and Amazon Prime exists, you need not reinvent the wheel. You just say Walmart Prime or Walmart VIP program <laughs> and you charge whatever, $99 and you do two-day delivery. You have no choice but to match them yep. and hopefully beat them. And I think that's why Amazon is so good. It's a really illustrative example um, is looking through the – the windshield at your customer as opposed to the rearview mirror at your competitors, you would learn, oh, they love two day. What's the next thing? Same day. Hmm. And Amazon is really getting focused on same day for prime users. They're not saying what what's Walmart or Target are doing. Right. They're just saying, you know, what's the next thing our customers want? They want same day. And I don't know if you've had this experience where 
you order next day or you order Prime and it shows up the same day and you're like, wait yeah. a second. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Wait a second. Did I, am I being charged for this? And they're like, no, we're just delighting you. You didn't even realize it. Mm -hmm. um, and then will you churn if you're getting your lightning cable the same day? Nope. And then I don't, I don't know if you had this experience. Postmates has done a partnership with Apple stores here in um, – uh, the Bay Area, and they're like, I, I, I got my wife a new computer, and they were like, get it today. It, it was like, get it tomorrow, pick it up, whatever, and it was like, get it in two hours for $8. <laughs> and I was like, $8? Sure. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, I, I don't want to go park for $4 and yeah. have to go pick it up. So yeah, $8 sounds delightful to not leave the house right now. Um, so this delighting customers really has to do with competitors. What are competitors upset? What are what are what is it that your competitors do that upset users? Hmm. Well, charging for an extra bag, right, on an airline. So maybe you offer that as complimentary, or maybe it's how you board. You know, there could be all number of reasons of how you could study it. And if you think about Uber, the idea that you had to tell the driver where you're going in a cab <laughs> yeah. and have that whole 10 minute negotiation about the route you're going to take, mm -hmm. it all went away. And then paying where you would give the driver 20 and they'd be like, okay, it's $12. $12. You're like, can I have my change? And they'd be like, okay, here's five. Well, they'd be like, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> really six. You're going to give me a $1 tip? Like, you know, they're, they're waiting for you to say, keep the change. Uh, yep. Yeah. And they got rid of that friction. So it's like you can study the bad competitors. Like Wall Street Journal subscription, you know, haranguing you is yep. a great idea for somebody to make it easy breezy to subscribe and unsubscribe. And actually, there are some gyms now that you can pause your gym membership at any time you want. Mm. And they just charge you for the time you use it or whatever. Yep. So if you want to, you know, pause for the two-week vacation and not pay, you can do that. Okay, key metrics here in our seventh and final slide, and this is critically important because this is the dashboard of the plane. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is the navigation system. What should we be thinking about here, Jackie? Um, well, so first, before we, one of the things we talk a lot about is that the founder's job is to hire the team, set the vision, and then to set the metrics. And so let's focus on the last one, key metrics here. Mm -hmm. So Jackie, how do you recommend founders set their metrics? Yeah, so the most important thing is really to figure out the North Star metric, the one that matters and, and captures really the core value of the product. For example, Airbnb, you know, would be how many nights are booked, Facebook, daily active users, Quora, how many questions are answered. Um, but one thing to be really careful about when you're determining your North Star is unintended consequences. So for example, we've been talking about the Wall Street Journal, say you're a newspaper, <laughs> uh, to be nameless, and you make it your North Star metric is turn, right? Um, you don't want to lose subscribers. And to make it really hard to lose subscribers, you make them call to do it. Yeah. So now you have just have a lot of really angry customers. <laughs> so you know, it's not a great so you, you need other metrics that can work in the short term. But the long term might be a bad reputation. And then yeah. people don't resubscribe. And they're just like, you know what? I give up on this. I'll go find my news in other places. Right. We have this at inside.com. I decided that net new subscribers were how we would do bonuses for the editorial team. And I got some pushback from people in my own company that said the marketing team should be responsible for it. And I said, you know what? In some businesses, the marketing team would be responsible for the number of customers who showed up, the new subscribers to a newsletter. And in some situations, the product is so good that it spreads organically. People forward it to each other and they tell each other. And you don't need to have marketing, which is like a Tesla or a great restaurant. So you could either do the two-for-one lunch special and buy ads and give out flyers and have somebody outside throwing that arrow around uh, in traffic. Or you could just make the best hamburger and consistently make it and have a line outside because it's the best burger. Mm -hmm. I said, we want to be the latter. If anybody is not on board with this anymore, let me know. Lo and behold, some people were not on board with my vision. And this is sometimes when you're the captain, you have to set the vision. And the vision for us here at launch, oh, so anyway, to, to just put a final note on that, I just said, you know what? Everybody's going to get uh, have 15% of their compensation associated with net new subscribers. How many did you lose this month? How many did you gain this month? Let's subtract those two numbers from each other. And what's the net? The net result is 400 new people. Okay, great. We want to get to 1,000. And so you have to keep working on the editorial and believe that better editorial means more subscribers. 
And it does, mm -hmm. obviously. Some people did not want to do that work to go from an okay or a good newsletter to a great one. Because what we learned was an, a bad, an okay, and a good newsletter all performed the same, mm. which was low performance. You'd have people unsubscribe, and you'd have very few people sign up. But when they hit great, like Stratetria's or The Skim or Red Tricycle uh, or some of our top newsletters, they become so invaluable that people tell each other about them and it grows. And then at launch, it's very simple. We're placing a lot of bets on companies, monitoring them, and then figuring out who we're going to do additional funding to, to have the biggest ownership stake in the best companies. And at the end of the day, we know 99% of our compensation will come from the outliers. That doesn't mean we don't do a great job on all customers, which are our founders, but it does mean we have to figure out, can this company get to 100 million in revenue? So I backed into, and you might remember the lunch where I brought this up. I said, listen, we're in the business of $100 million revenue companies. The company's at a million dollars in run rate and we're investing in it. How do we 100 exit in seven years? Mm -hmm. Do we have a theory on that? Do we have a thesis? If we do, great. Does the founder have a thesis? Great. Do we Are we in alignment that it's possible? And not only is it possible, is it probable? Mm -hmm. And can we even come up with a percentage that Com gets to a million subscribers? I knew Com could get to a million paid subscribers. And I know Inside could go for a million in revenue and 100 exit and become a unicorn. There's a lot of work between those two things, but that's the founder's job. Right. And when you put your foot down and say, this is the metric, you might lose team members. You might get fought on it. Just like somebody who says, we're going to the new world. We're not going to take, we're not going around Cape Horn and going to India to get spices. We're not going to China to get tea. We're going across the Atlantic. <laughs> and we don't know what's there. Either you get on the ship not knowing, or you can take the trade route and get spices and, you know, uh, go to China. <laughs> but that's different. You can get silk and spices. We're going to go to the new world, and we don't know if that's a one-way trip or our deaths or a round trip. Um, it's very important as the founder that you decide and that you then go to each of your lieutenants, each of your you know, people who are rowing the ship and make sure we're rowing in the right direction. Because you know what the worst thing is? Somebody doesn't believe and they don't get off the ship. Yep. Now you got somebody rowing in the wrong direction <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even plotting a mutiny on the bounty. And that is dangerous. Mm -hmm. A mutiny when you're in the middle of the ocean without enough provisions to go back, you can only go forward, that's deadly. All right, I went on a tangent. Let's get back to it. <laughs> well, I know that metrics are very important for our own accelerator companies. Um, so it's something that we talk about all the time. And how, how, do you advisor, how do you advise the founder specifically to track their metrics? Like what are the actual metrics that we're advising our founders to track? Demond, yes. why don't we go through the last class or two? Sure. Yeah. So... A, we ask our founders to track them on a weekly basis. Why? To for accountability. Got so it. every day you actually should be you you should be moving the needle. Yeah. And we don't force them to do it every day, but hopefully they have that discipline internally. Yeah. Uh, but at least on a weekly basis, we want to see their metrics. And so at the end of each pitch that they give each week, we ask them for an update on their metric. Um, and then in terms of how we ask them to choose those metrics, typically it is a North Star-ish, which is usually around revenue. So whether it's uh, direct revenue sales or perhaps number of seats or users, something very closely tied to revenue. Um, and that's typically kind of generic to the businesses. And then what we, what we also like to ask is for a secondary revenue typically something more specific to the business. Um, so um, one of my favorite examples is from Fitbod. We asked them the number of reps yeah. um, that, uh, that that they tracked uh, yeah. throughout the- So you have how many users they have. Right. You have daily active users, monthly active users. But now knowing like the extent, yep, this would be like Netflix knowing not only um, how many people subscribe and pay, right. not only how many people used it this month, week, or even today, how many hours did they watch? Yep. Because that really is telling. If somebody is binge watching- Or how many episodes they completed, maybe. Well, episodes completed is good to know, should you renew the series? Yeah. And then if if a series is completed, right. you know that that genre, and I, I bet you that's how they got to comedy. They must have realized that when you can't figure out what series to start, 
just yes. watching Ricky yeah. Gervais. I don't know if you have this experience, but I'm this. just you do this too, yeah, right? Yeah. You're like, what series? Oh, look at him. <laughs> Sir Charles is nodding too. But it's like, what what series should we watch? It's like I don't know. We have to ask our friends at the next dinner party. <laughs> yeah. We'll punt. Let's watch Amy Schumer's. Yeah. Right. Let's watch the latest Ricky Gervais. Yeah. Which people tell me I look like Ricky Gervais. Is that because I'm fat and overweight, or what is it? My hairline. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Do I look like Ricky Gervais? Sandy Be honest hair. With you. It's just the sandy hair. That's it. Is it? Yeah. What do you think? Or is it my wit? <laughs> it's or both. my inappropriateness? I'm not inappropriate. <laughs> that I'm too. Joking. That too. Um, I, I did. You guys see Ricky Gervais's new series, Afterlife? I've been meaning to check Charles, it out. Have you seen it? It's incredible. I think it's his most poignant stuff. I, I you know, I, I just love that guy because he was so um, brutal to the Golden Globes. Like he just took every Hollywood celebrity mm -hmm. out for just yeah. watch oh, Golden yeah. Globes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I his Mel Ricky Gibson. Gervais. Yeah. Do you remember his? <laughs> he just went after Mel Gibson <laughs> horribly yeah. and destroyed him, and he deserves to be taken down. And then you have the series, um, and uh, it's um, the series is just about somebody who has experienced loss. I'm not spoiling anything. It's the premise is that Ricky Gervais's wife has died of cancer, and he's contending with that, and. It's just a real meditation on grief that is, I really recommend it to anybody else. Okay, back to your startup. Oh the tracking and refining metrics over time, what are good practices for that? Sure. So what, I've, what I'm a firm believer of in is setting yearly goals that are adjusted quarterly. Um, so when, when talking with founders to do these adjustments, uh, we recommend or I recommend having quarterly offsites. So the value mm -hmm. of doing um, these offsites I have found to be immense. Um, and I really don't think founders have considered to do them enough. Um, and so at these quarterly offsites, what you're trying to do is set quantitative and qualitative goals for the next 12 months, but more, but really focusing on the next three months. So quantitative could be something like daily average, uh, daily average user growth or revenue, something along that. Qualitative goals would be making a key hire, shipping a feature, uh, getting a product, a new product out the door. Um, setting both of those quantitative and qualitative. And then after you have set those goals, ideally at an offsite, um, making sure that you're tracking those on a weekly basis. So one of the things I love to see founders do is actually like putting them up on the wall, uh, making mm. posters. Uh, yes. You can put them on your Slack and, and keep reminders. Yes. And so these I are- I love that on Slack. I mean, yes. Slack is annoying and a distraction, um, but when, it, when it's working well and everybody gets to see a conversation occurring between individuals that they wouldn't normally have been privy to. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, everybody knows that this thing is going down. And then when everybody sees the metrics coming in, it's like, oh, great, we're in good shape, you know? Um, so we have plus one for Slack when used properly and piping the data in is so great. I love this idea of the offsites. We're gonna do our launch offsite, I guess, when we're in Sydney mm -hmm. on the Wit Sundays. We should actually maybe set up quarterly, and then what we should do is have each of the managing directors maybe lead one of them. So if we have the other, each of the managing directors could do one, and Sam could do one. But we should go back to quarterly. So great suggestion for creating more work for yourself. I love, I love when I do that. Yeah, Tomas like I insist startups do quarterly. I'm like, great. I insist that you do that for our startup called Launch. Perfect. <laughs> uh, but tracking is super important, and there's so many tools out here. I mean, back in the day, you would have to have people on your team spend just in ordinate amount of time to do this metrics. And now there's almost like too many metrics. And this is why I feel like sometimes people go metric shopping. That's what I call it, metric shopping, where they're like, but I worked this many hours today or this many hours this week, or uh, I did this many phone calls. And you as the manager have to realize incentives matter. Be careful if you set incentives, because we talked about this before. You know, if the plane is going really fast, that's great. Unless it's heading towards the ground and there's no altitude, <laughs> right? Or if it's, what if it's going backwards and it's falling and it's flipping as it's falling, right? You want a steady flight at a great pace, at the right altitude and knowing your destination and that, and you don't want to have the yoke or the pitch be off or else the plane could flip and everybody can die. You have to be the pilot who has control over all of that instrumentation. And, you know, sometimes the airspeed is the most important thing. Sometimes your altitude is, right? And they all do work in conjunction. So focusing solely on churn or f solely on people signing up and top line growth, these this is a mistake. We've seen people with leaky buckets yep. spend huge amounts of money. And there was a very famous one. I think 
Paul Graham from Y Combinator fame said that the fastest growing company they ever had was that um, company that was cleaning houses. Was oh. it Home Joy? Home Joy or Ease? Or was it Handy? Handy, maybe. Oh. Anyway, somebody, yeah, Charles or yeah. Nick, type in uh, Y Combinator cleaning startup failure. I'm pretty sure it was Home Joy. Yeah, it might have been Home Joy, I think. Anyway, Home Joy raised a ton of money and they were going to be the Uber of cleaning your house. Mm -hmm. So, what did they do? They took that venture money. They hired a ton of people really quick. They went really fast. They were losing money on their unit economics as per our previous discussion. Um, and their chart is up and to the right. At a, <laughs> it's just incredible violent. It was home job or home joy. I think home joy. joy. Home joy. Yeah. And so it was going up and to the right. And there is an actual chart of it. Maybe Charles can show it. <laughs> and the great part about this chart was it was like 24 months of data. And it is on a tear. <laughs> and the next month, you expand the chart, it's at zero. Because they were losing money and they were, I think, they were breaking the employment law by having people get paid on a, as contractors mm -hmm. when they were actually full time. Mm -hmm. And it was all kinds of horrible things going on there. So without rails, capitalism, growth, and, you know, it can be a leaky bucket or they could be, uh, your reputation could be so bad that people don't come back to your restaurant. Right. It's like if you charge a dollar for a hamburger and the next day everybody gets food poisoning, yeah, they're not coming back. And if you ran out of money, and if they loved it and you charged a dollar and you ran out of money, well, you can't pay your rent. So be careful. Yep. Okay. I think we did it. Awesome. Uh, and we did it in how many minutes? 85 minutes. This is supposed to be 50 minutes. We keep saying we're going to do this in 50 minutes. minutes, 40 minutes. And it keeps being <laughs> double what we think we're going to do or more. That's because I think, um, and I really appreciate the time you put into this, um, Jackie and Jason DeMont, uh, because it really does come from the tremendous effort you've both put into the founders in uh, our portfolio and from our accelerator. And for that, I'm very thankful to be working with you. Uh, and on behalf of the startups, uh, we all thank you for the effort you put in and the knowledge you're sharing. This knowledge is uh, free for everybody to use. You can go to thisweekinstartups.com slash scale and get the actual deck. And if you're seeing this um, in real time, we might only have four episodes up and there are six more to come. So this is going to be a 10-part series. And then we're going to take this 10-part series, let it sit for a year, and maybe we'll um, use some of it at Founder University or Scale Conference. Um, and we're looking for your feedback on it. If you have feedback, uh, demont at launch.co, Jackie at launch.co, and I'm Jason at launch.co. I'm Jason on the Twitter, and you can also follow TWI Startups if you want to get more content like this. And if you really want to help the show, write a review on iTunes if you're so inclined, if it's five star. If it's less than four stars, go ahead and email Jackie at launch.co. <laughs> she really wants the, your feedback. Um, and tell a friend who wants to start a company about the show. We recently have had our 10-year anniversary, and I think we're going to hit 1,000 shows. That's something worth celebrating. We'll do that later this year or next year. And this show is an archive of a massive amount of knowledge, success, and failure available to you free 24 hours a day. No excuses. If you want to be successful in life, you want to be a great founder, go to thisweekinstartups.com or our YouTube channel, or go to Angel Podcast and learn how great startups are built, funded, uh, and scaled. All right. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.